Hi, Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to talk about something this week uh, that it's, I guess you could say it's a little, uh, a little uh, sensitive. And that is, uh, it, that has to do with chastening, uh, scourging. And so we're looking at Hebrews chapter 12. which begins with laying aside the sin nature that so easily entangles us. That's Romans 6, 11. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And run with endurance the race set out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Not grow weary and lose heart. We've been looking at for several years now, seven years, I guess, uh, at how wonderful and how marvelous and how majestic our Lord Jesus Christ is. And we found that in his sacrifice, he has, by that one sacrifice, perfected forever those whom he is setting apart. And we've been introduced to the faithfulness of that God who provided such a complete sacrifice. And he has given us this testimony in the mouth of more than two or three witnesses. He's given us many more. Many have been called to testify to or testify of the faithfulness of God in their lives. When we look at their lives, God has freely, honestly, openly recorded the history of of, of them and their lives, men who murdered, men who stole, lied, cheated, and God knows what else, and yet in whose lives God was faithful. The 11th chapter of Hebrews tells us that in God's faithfulness, he determined that there would be a perfection in the Lord Jesus Christ and that these two to three witnesses without us would not be made perfect. And so the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the basis of all of that faithfulness. Now we are commanded by God to consider diligently the one who endured such contradiction of these sinners against himself, lest we become weary and lest we faint. Uh, and though many a sermon's been preached about the opposition of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jews to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course, that that's all true. I ask you folks to add to that the fact that the great contradiction that Christ endured was from us. We were his enemies. We were hostile to him. We were not believing him, not receiving him, not serving him. And yet in that condition of enmity and hostility, he died for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'd like to direct your attention to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. You and I haven't done what Christ did. We have not resisted unto uh, the shedding of blood in, the, in, the constant, in our constant battle against sin. And I believe the reference in verse 4 is to, is to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ in our place. 
It isn't just torture or death, but it's the death that made possible our redemption. Dearly beloved, there is no way that we could have any part in that. I think that's the purpose of verse 4. Now, I don't want to skip over this lightly. You have not yet resisted unto blood. Now, too many people have looked at that and said, well, he was speaking to first century Hebrews and they hadn't been put to death yet for their testimony for Christ. Stephen had. Stephen was already stoned before Paul the apostle ever became the apostle. By the time that this epistle was written, some had already been martyred for their faith in Christ. I do not think that that's the purpose of the verse. There is no way, no matter what happens in your life, there never could be a comparison with what Christ has done for us to leave the glories of heaven, the, the adulation of the angels, the place where he, he's the supreme monarch to become incarnate in human flesh, to suffer the limitations of that flesh, not only to endure the difficulties from his enemies, but the contradiction of those for whom he came to die. And, and for who, those whom he came to pay the price of redemption. No way could that ever happen to us. But you've forgotten something. You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as sons, verse 5, underline that, as sons. If you have the authorized version, it says children, but it's sons. And all of the strength, all of the power of, of the verse depends upon those words. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as unto sons. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay. Now we have a passage of scripture that goes clear through to the 13th verse. I want to try to lay some groundwork uh, on this for your thinking. <clears throat> there are tremendous numbers of sermons that immediately depart from the grace of God here and try to bring Christians under burden and conviction, under law. First of all, I want you to note that this exhortation, parakaleo is the word, is something that's to be an exhortation of comfort, to be an encouragement. Well, you know, you, so I admit a superficial reading doesn't, doesn't seem to be, but it is. It, it is not to be a threat. It is not there to frighten you, but to encourage you. And it continually speaks, not just to the Old Testament saint, in Proverbs, but the word of God continually speaks unto sons, those who belong to God, those who are his own, those whom he considers to be in an, 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 in an adult relationship with him. It is a word of encouragement to God's people. All right. Now, clearly at the outset, it is not a word of encouragement to those who are not God's people, but it is a word of encouragement to those of you who belong to Christ. Despise not 
thou the chastening of the Lord. Oh, Steve, Pastor Steve, what could be so encouraging about chastening? Nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Well, Steve, what could be so encouraging about that? And many who preach on this say, here is the key passage of scripture that proves to you that God does, he really does look on your sin, even though you have other passages of scripture where God declares that your sins and iniquities have been removed as far as the east is from the west. They buried in the depths of the sea, sought for and not found, cast behind his back, washed as white as snow, that by the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Yet in the light of this great body of scripture, there are those who re actually rejoice in this passage of scripture, declaring that here is clear evidence from the word of God that God has not, not forgotten your sins that he has not buried them in the deepest sea. He's not cast them behind his back. He hasn't forgotten them. He hasn't forgiven them. He had, he, nor washed them white as snow, but that he is in fact looking at your sin. Even though verse one in, in chapter 12 here in Hebrews, even though verse one began with let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin, that's the sin nature that so easily entangles us. Do not disregard the fact that we are here called sons. Underline that in your Bible. Highlight that. We're called sons. What did it cost God to call us sons? The passages from Proverbs, I was taught and I've been told many times by those who are supposed to be experts, that God being our Father is a New Testament truth, and yet this same concept is repeated in the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy, where God declares to the children of Israel that He is dealing with them as with sons. It is a son who is instructed of his father. There are a tremendous number. There's, I hate to even think about it. All the things that I did that bothered my father that never would have bothered the, the I don't know, the state highway patrol. You know, they, they never cared whether I mowed the lawn. They didn't care, you know, whether I was a, a little bit, you know, snippy to my dad or, or whether I told him a lie. You could call all of those things sin, but folks, where no law is, there is no transgression. You're not breaking any law with your heavenly Father. You are in a family relationship. And God very openly, both in the Old Covenant and in the New, speaks of his children as sons. Sons. Because the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ has been imputed to you, for God to call you his son, think of what that cost him. It cost him everything that he had. It, it would have been impossible for God to use such language had he not become incarnate in human flesh, become your kinsman redeemer, and die in your place. So is it really unusual then that, that for a loving heavenly father who paid such a price, a price that defies human description, to be interested in you? You are precious to him. Your redemption cost you nothing. 
But it cost God everything he had. You're worth what God paid for you. And that was Jesus Christ himself. It does not seem unreasonable then that a possession so valuable would involve the care and the concern of a loving, loving Heavenly Father. Not a hateful Heavenly Father, but a loving Heavenly Father. If the concept of this passage is sin, the response to sin is punishment, not chastisement. Okay? The response to sin is judgment, not encouragement. God in, indeed deals with sin. He sits as a judge. In your case, that judgment fell on Christ. And it, it can, can't, it, it, no way can it fall on you. But in the case of God's enemies, it falls on them. But in this case, he's dealing with us. He's as a father. It, it's interesting that he didn't just say son, but he said, my son, my son, despise not the only place the word occurs in the Greek New Testament. It's a present active imperative with the negation. If you're a student of grammar, a present imperative with a negative carries with it the implication that this is something that you've been doing. Don't do it anymore. Don't keep on. Don't continue thinking lightly about the instruction of the Lord. The word despise literally means to think down on. Don't think less than you should about the chastening of the Lord. You know, you, you lose a tremendous amount in this passage. If you take chastisement as a whipping for sin, you know, like your heavenly father taking you out to the woodshed for a good old fashioned butt whooping, there is a tremendous difference between being punished for sin, a punishment which fell on Christ, and being instructed by your father as his son. Don't you want to be instructed? Why isn't learning wonderful at the hand of the Lord? Why isn't this a blessing instead of some kind of a burden? You, you folks should not go away from this message terrified that God is going to spank you for being naughty. What he's doing is he's instructing you. Don't think little of the instruction of the Lord. Don't think down on it. And, and that's... I believe that's why the translators translated it despised. Stop thinking so little of the training of the Lord, nor faint, nor faint. It's a present imperative. That is, become very weak when thou art rebuked of him. Then the concept uh, seems to be in the Christian mind how can it possibly be that a Christian would be rebuked of the Lord if we're not dealing in the area of sin? Well, because the strength of sin is the law. And you have been totally delivered from the law. The greatest temptation you face, the greatest enemy, dearly beloved, listen to me, the greatest enemy you face is that inbred longing to go back under that legal religious system based on human merit. And the first thing people do in this passage of Scripture is look at it from the standpoint of human merit. They don't want to be scourged. 
of the Lord. It is inconceivable that I could live my life, folks, without at one time or another doing something that might be displeasing to a loving Heavenly Father. Probably every day, every hour, In John, we read, if we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. So sin is not the question. I'm not being rebuked for sin. The area of these verses is not the area of the walk of the flesh, but of the Christian experience. There is much in my life that deserves rebuke. As I've already pointed out, every single aspect of my life belongs, it all belongs to the Lord. They're all a gift from the Lord. The air I breathe, the, the ability to, to sleep, to walk, Surely he has some right in, 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 that, in that area. I'm not to look down on his instruction because I, I, surely I need it. The one who does not receive instruction of the Father is one who is not loved. You know, you parents who, who are not properly instructing your children are not loving your children. There are Areas of rebuke. You know, it'd be an easy thing to, you know, to say, well, you know, I'll just give up. Lord didn't let, he didn't let me build, Steve, he didn't let me build that big cross out there with a restaurant in the arm. You know, so I'll just quit. You know, and of course, one of the problems in instruction in discipline, in training, is to quit. You know, hey, what happened to old brother so-and-so? I, I don't know. I hadn't seen him in ages. He just I guess he just quit. That, that's the guy in this verse that fainted. God clearly indicates the possibility here that from the standpoint of a faithful walk with him, we can just give up. Doesn't mean anybody's going to hell. Please don't email me. I believe the passage clearly says that we should anticipate instruction and we should anticipate rebuke. If there, if there wasn't any rebuke, I'd have to conclude that everything I did was, was just perfectly in line with his will. And, and well, that, that'd be great. That'd be terrific, but it'd be terribly egotistical. It would also indicate that there would be no need for instruction. Now, I may be wrong here, but I am suggesting to you folks, for your own thinking, that instruction without rebuke is not instruction. Well, God wouldn't treat me that way, so I, I guess I'll quit. Steve, it sure, it sure took a lot of spirit out of me. You know, I think it's easy to charge God with partiality. I mean, well, you know, look at that person. You know, I mean, Steve, look at that guy. I mean, look at how healthy they are, how wealthy they are, how, how much, look at how much fun this, that they're having. I mean, why do I have to go through all of this? I can't say it. Why do I have to go through all this and they don't? Why me? Why me? We can argue why me. I, I hear it almost every day. Why me? Can't God do with you as he pleases? He, he bought you. You are absolutely his. If you're to be a Stephen Stone at, at an early age, is that bad? If you're to be a John who lives for many, many years but finally dies in isolation, is that so bad? Is dearly beloved, is the dream for us to be happy, wealthy, wise, successful, or, or is it to be submitted under the mighty hand of an all-loving God that he might exalt us 
in due season. God says, after ye have suffered a while. Oh, dearly beloved. We, we, we read in the book of Acts that the disciples went around daily ex exhorting the brethren that with much suffering, they must enter in. And there, there seems to be some place in the mind of the Christian, a tiny, I don't know, cell of, of rebellion that says, why? Why? When my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and why, when I'm redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, why is suffering such a part of that experience? And yet, it's what you know in every other aspect of life. Isn't that interesting? You're not going to be a famous bull rider without suffering. All right? I got a friend. He's still got the, the hole in his hat. Our professional sports education, the, the rigors of the training, I, I can't become a minister of the gospel without, without educating myself. Every once in a while, there may be someone who, who is so gifted that they, they can you know, preach without ever opening this book. I, I've never been able to do that. I've, I've met some that did it for a while and fell flat on their face. My point is, folks, we suffer to become an expert in any, any discipline. You know, I hate, to, I hate to tell stories on my dad, but I believe he anticipated that if he had just buy, if my my dad thought if he just buy him a guitar, he could pick it up and he could play it, and it's he'd sound like Roy Clark. But boy, when he played it, it didn't sound like Roy Clark, and so he decided it wasn't worth the discipline. Why in every other area of life are we willing to suffer, to anticipate, to expect, in fact, to actually enjoy instruction, and yet we don't, we don't, we don't hear? You know, I, I want to learn this. I want to run that computer. I want to know how to build that house. I want to know how to, I want to, I want to know more than that what that software program knows, or I want to, I want to be better than Tiger Woods, or I want to be the, I want to be the, the best bull rider there ever was, Justin McBride, or somebody else, or, you know, we're eager to do it, yet when it comes to our walk with Christ, there's some kind of little fleshly rebellion that says, why me? Why should it be like this? Why should it be this way? God is instructing us in, in the 10th verse that it's, it's so that we might become a sharer in his holiness. And despite what you might think, holiness is not sinlessness, but separation to God. You see, the problem is many times in our lives, we don't need God that bad. But there will come a time, believe me, there will come a time when there is no other resource, no other hope, no other help but Him. Do not think little about the instruction of the Lord. Don't give up when He rebukes you. Re rebuke's a marvelous means of instruction if it's handled by one who knows how to handle it and and it's done in love. And that's God. He is not dealing with us as enemies. He's dealing with sons. He's not dealing judicially under law, but as, as a, a father to son. It's a parent with child. It's for whom the Lord loves. For whom the Lord loves. It's, it's a present active. Vindicative. For whom the Lord loves. There's a, there's a continuity to that love. There's a, a faithfulness in that love. There's a continuing uh, 
constant in that love that is different, vastly different than any possible human experience for whom the Lord always loves continuously, continuously loves, he instructs. In fact, he even scourges every son whom he receives. Oh my goodness, scourges. Steve, isn't scourging being whipped for sin? No, it's not. No. But because we are sons. You know, there's an old story about, you know, many have heard it, about the father who appears to be manhandling his his son, little little boy, cute, just as cute as he can be in his Oshkosh bagosh overalls, hardly big enough to walk. You know, and you see the kid stumble and the, the father beats him with a, a little switch and, and he gets up and the father helps him up and then beats him again. And, and if you saw that, you'd probably call the police. Except that the temperature was 20 below zero. They were in a snow drift and they couldn't see the house. And the father knew that if the little boy laid down He'd die in the snow. And if you'd have known that, your attitude would have changed completely. I do not believe that we should see in the word scourge the idea that, that you have, you've been naughty and so God now has decided to bust your behind. I believe that takes people's minds away from the truth of this message. The concept, I think, is that God is applying whatever pressure necessary for us to learn. And He does that to every son whom He's receiving. Highlight the word every. Every son. There are no exceptions. Don't write me and say, Steve, he never chastens me, he never scourges me, he never. It is vastly important if you don't do anything else that you underline the word every in verse six so that when you look at those around you who seem to have it so good, you won't think that they don't have any trouble at all. Oh, but Steve... Pastor Steve, if, if they only knew the load I carry. Folks, there is no place whatsoever for self-pity. There's absolutely the likelihood that God is not training and using whatever is necessary to make sure that training works the same way in your life as, as he is in someone else's. But believe me, it's in every son whom he's receiving everyone after that you have suffered a while make you perfect establish settle you strengthen you i was born in the 50s uh grew up in the 60s we lived fairly well we we didn't have much I left high school, joined the Navy, came home to work cattle and horses. I had to, I had to work my way through college. I needed some kind of an income. So I did ranch work. And I, I finally found that I could uh, actually do that. I thought I could ride just about any horse, found out that wasn't true. In the ranch I worked on, it stretched for miles in several directions. I'd, I'd never seen a, a ranch like that in all my life. You know, you drive for 32 minutes uh, in the driveway before you get to the front door, one of them places. Now, that's probably an exaggeration, but, but one day I ran into the owner, a nice lady, and uh, the lady asked me if I wanted a glass of milk and a donut or, or something. And I said, well, that, that sounded really great. And, and uh, I just uh, happened to casually mention to her just what a gorgeous, gorgeous place that this was. And she said to me, 
I'd trade it all in a, in a, in a, in a minute for a husband who loved me. And I walked out of there thinking, what I see on the outside is no indication at all of what may be on the inside. You know, maybe that poor person, too feeble to walk or, or ride, knows blessings, I'll never know. But let me tell you, God declares that this chastening and scourging is in every son whom he receives. I'm sure it's different for you than it is for me, but it is every one of us. And it is because, because he loves us. There is purpose in his rebuke, his child training, his scourging. It is so that we partake of his holiness. The text makes it clear. It's so that we bear fruit. Don't despise it. Don't faint. That is, don't give up. Of course, now this is where I get to tell you that this is what the new man always does. I describe that, that new man as the one who understands his position in Christ, who understands that God is always faithful even when we're not. The new man is the one who has assurance, who has hope, who looks beyond this life to the next, who believes God, who trusts in Christ, not himself, but he rests in the finished work of Christ and he gives God all the glory. 